As some of you know, I uh, grew up in a really small town, and in high school I worked at the grocery store. Which grocery store, you might be wondering? The grocery store. The one grocery store. You know, living in a small town, you kind of know everybody, by face at least, so whenever somebody came in that you didn't know, or had never seen before, that was kind of a big deal. And there was this one family that came in regularly, you know, husband, wife, daughter. They were very poor, uh, had dirty, torn clothes, and they all had sort of a an eye thing. You know that Forrest Whitaker eye thing where one eye kind of droops, you know that thing? Well, they all had that thing. All of them. I never caught their names. The only thing that the dad ever said to me was Copenhagen. Uh, but it was generally known around the store that they were kind of, uh, yeah. But I don't know, maybe I can't judge because I actually went back to my hometown early this summer for a cousin's wedding. Uh, was my cousin the bride or groom, you may be wondering? Both. Both the bride and groom were cousins of mine. Now, in fairness, one of them was more of a second cousin, and they weren't like cousins related to each other. Like, one was a cousin on my dad's side, and one was on my mom's side. So it was only really weird to me and my sister, but still, yeah, it was, it was weird. And to be even more honest, the first girl that I, you know, went with in school was actually the cousin of a guy who married my cousin, whose son was the guy who married my other cousin earlier this year. The fact of the matter is, in many locations, in many situations, intermarriage is just a thing that happens. And it's usually not a problem in most cases, but in very isolated cases over a long period of time, it can lead to problems. And in extreme cases, it can lead to an all-out genetic catastrophe. So here's a look at some of the most inbred people of all time. Look, inbreeding happens. And in isolated cases, it's not the worst thing in the world. There's really more of a stigma to it than there should be. But in some cases, it is the worst thing in the world. While researching this topic, I found plenty of cases of incest cults and sexual abuse that are just disturbing enough to make your skin crawl. And I chose to leave those out of this because, frankly, it, it, it made me sad. But if you really want to learn more about cases like the Golers in Canada and the cults in Australia and others, I'll put links to that down in the description. Sickos. So on that note, let's start by getting our terms right. So inbreeding is the breeding or reproduction of animals or people over multiple generations. Incest is the act of two closely related people getting um, extra close. Now the word incest is often used interchangeably with a type of sexual abuse, and let's face it, those two things unfortunately do go together way too often. But in the case of two consensual adults, it's weird, but not necessarily illegal. Although there are various laws across different states that prohibit marriage amongst blood relatives specifically to, uh, you know, avoid inbreeding. But it's not like if you marry somebody that just happens to be a second cousin that you'll have kids with eyes in the back of their knees or something. But you do run more of a risk of recessive traits being expressed. Now this is pretty basic genetics. We all carry dominant and recessive genes, and the recessive genes only get expressed if both parents carry that recessive gene, which is why sometimes you have two brown-headed people who wind up having a red-headed kid. And the more people with that same recessive gene intermingle, the more that gene is gonna show up. Now if you're talking about red hair, obviously that's not a big deal. But if you're talking about hemophilia, or any number of congenital disorders, it is a big deal. Which is why over time, with a lot of familial buggery, you run into some problems. And here are a few examples of those problems. The Blue Fugates of Kentucky. Ruth Pendergrass was a nurse in Hazard County in 1960 when a woman walked in with blue skin. Blue lips, blue fingernails, blue everything. Now normally this could mean that a person was oxygen deprived, but after they did some tests on her, they found out that she was perfectly healthy outside of a minor cold, which is what brought her in there in the first place. She was really perplexed by this, so she started looking into it, and that's when she discovered the legend of the Blue Fugates of Troublesome Creek. It all began with Martin Fugate, who immigrated from France in the 1820s and married Elizabeth Smith and settled down in the hills of Kentucky. And by some amazing coincidence, both of them carried the extremely rare recessive gene for blue skin and four of their seven children came out blue. And the part of Kentucky where they settled was seriously isolated. They didn't even get a railroad there until 1910. So the family intermarried, starting with their son, who married his mother's sister. This continued for over 200 years. And the more this went on, the bluer they got. And the bluer they got, the more they felt ostracized by the wider community, so they kind of retreated even further into the hills. 
which led to more inbreeding. Over time, they became a bit of like local lore, you know, the blue hillbillies that lived in the woods, kind of like Bigfoot, until around the 1960s when some of them tried to integrate back into society. And it was then that a couple of the younger Fugates, Patrick and Rachel, reached out to the University of Kentucky Medical School trying to find some kind of cure. They were incredibly embarrassed about their skin color and they didn't want to be ostracized anymore. So after doing some tests and research, they found out that the blue Fugates carried something called methemoglobin, which is a non-functional blue version of our regular hemoglobin that carries oxygen in our cells. Now hemoglobin is what makes our blood red, and it's the reason why people with a lighter complexion have a little bit of a pinkish hue to them, because it's that blood color coming through their skin. And one of my favorite little factoids is that when you're doing color correction for video and film, which I've done plenty of in my time, the skin tone that you correct for is actually the same no matter how dark the pigment is in a person's skin, because you're actually correcting for the blood that flows underneath, and the blood underneath is the same in all of us. I always like that, there's just a little bit of kumbaya-ness to that fact. Luckily for the Fugates, there was a solution to their problem, and it was, ironically, to add more blue. Methylene blue dye, for some reason, causes the body to turn methemoglobin into regular hemoglobin. So they gave this to Patrick and Rachel, and apparently their skin color changed to normal right before their eyes in minutes. That might be the most X-Men shit I've ever heard of. With a daily dose of this blue dye, the Fugates have been able to reintegrate into society. Go science. Allentown, New York. In the foothills of the Adirondacks in New York State, there lies a tiny community that's called Allentown, though the people who live there just call it the Hollow. And the reason it's called Allentown is because pretty much everybody there comes from one of two families, the larger of which is the Allens. These families have lived in almost total isolation for 200 years, living as subsistence farmers and trappers, with no police or fire department, and no problem marrying their siblings. Now due to the nature of this mountainous region, which is typical for a lot of these types of communities. These people were already pretty isolated for a long time, but it was when a dam was formed that flooded the Sacandaga Valley that they really got cut off. Most of the farmers in the area left for greener pastures, <laughs> literally, but the Allen and Catherine family stuck around because they refused to leave their ancestral home. Now, following that in the 1930s, the depression shut down a lot of the mills that were employment opportunities for a lot of the people in that area, so they just kind of like became even further isolated. Stories of abuse and incest among the families ran rampant in the surrounding communities, and infighting became so bad that it got to the point where the people of Allentown built a wall around their town, like some kind of medieval village. It wasn't until the 70s and 80s that social workers started to make inroads into the community, and what they found were houses with dirt floors, no AC, no heating, um, no running water, they used fire pits for warmth, basically just people living in primitive conditions. And they actually called in a local anthropology professor to come in and sort of study these people like they were some kind of uncontacted tribe. The people of the town refused any outside help at first, but eventually kind of warmed up and allowed the social workers to come in and weatherize their homes and introduce them to some modern comforts. The people of Allentown say that the stories of incest were overblown, but they do acknowledge that pretty much everybody there is related, so it's kind of impossible to avoid at least a little bit of inbreeding. A film was made in 1975 documenting the people of the area called The Hollow. I'll link to it in the description below. It's uh, enlightening. The Habsburg Dynasty. Some people intermarry because that's just their only option. Others do it because they're just better than everybody else. Royal families in Europe were notorious for inbreeding because marriage is one of the ways that they secured alliances amongst their empires and there were only so many royal families to go around so eventually you're gonna, you're gonna bang a cousin. But the Habsburgs took this policy to a whole other level. The House of Habsburg ruled states in and around the Holy Roman Empire in Eastern Europe from 1526 all the way up to 1918 when World War I kind of put the kibosh on all that imperial stuff. But one segment of the Habsburgs married into the Castile region of Spain, so they became known as the Spanish Habsburgs. It was Philip I who married Joanna of Castile in 1946, which put the Habsburgs on the throne in Spain, and they decided they didn't want somebody else to come in and do their trick and marry in and take the throne out from under them, so to avoid that, they just married each other for over 200 years. This constant intermarrying produced a litany of deformities and health problems which led to more than half of the Habsburg children dying before the age of 10. And the most visible physical defect amongst the Habsburgs was a protruding jaw, also known as the magnibular prognathism. This became so prevalent amongst that family that it actually became known as the Habsburg jaw. And it wasn't just that this was unattractive, it actually caused the problem, like some of them had trouble speaking and even eating. And this condition actually affected the most famous member of the Habsburg family, Marie Antoinette. Although it didn't affect her very seriously, it basically just had the effect of making her lower lip 
pooch out a little bit, which they said gave her the effect of always having something of a pout. But all that inbreeding came to an end with the birth of Charles II in 1665. He was the son of Philip IV, who married his sister's daughter, making him Charles's father and great uncle. Ay, ay, ay. Charles's jaw was so pronounced that he couldn't fully close his mouth, meaning that he drooled everywhere, and his tongue was so oversized that he couldn't speak until the age of eight. And he couldn't walk until he was four years old. He was weak, had chronic intestinal problems, and was impotent. Thank God. He also went a little bit crazy later in life when he insisted that his servants go dig up his ancestors so that he could have dinner with them, like you do. Stories about how inbred he was were so pervasive that when he died in the year 1700, stories began to circulate about his autopsy, claiming that he didn't have a drop of blood in his body, that his head was full of water, and that his testicles were black. Now, none of that was probably true, but he was so messed up that most people believed it. Charles II died without an heir, which led to the War of Spanish Succession that lasted for 13 years, finally putting an end to the Habsburg rule and all the incest that came with it. King Tutankhamun. The discovery of the tomb of Tutankhamun in 1922 was one of the most amazing archaeological finds of all time. The Egyptians buried their pharaohs with lavish displays of wealth, so most of their tombs were raided long ago and looted by uh, fortune hunters, but this was one of those super rare tombs that was actually unopened. Now before this discovery, Tutankhamun was a relatively unknown pharaoh. He was only 18 when he died. His reign was, you know, unremarkable by most accounts and it only lasted about a decade, but his tomb provided more information about ancient Egypt than any other discovery in history. But when his body was examined and later his DNA tested, it revealed more than we ever bargained for. Because the Egyptian royal family was super inbred. <laughs> Now keep in mind, the pharaohs were considered living gods. So while the Habsburgs intermarried each other in order to retain power, the ancient Egyptians believed that a normal person wasn't even allowed to touch a pharaoh lest you be smited by the gods. So they just hooked up with each other. And this went on for millennia. Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten, married his own sister, a practice that had been going on for hundreds of generations before, which is why Tutankhamun suffered from numerous genetic conditions, including a cleft palate, a massive overbite, fused vertebrae, and a club foot, which required the use of a cane. And even at such a young age, Tutankhamun practiced incest himself. He was married at age eight or nine to his wife, Anka Sanaman, who had previously been married to her own father. And found in Tutankhamun's tomb were two mummified fetuses that were believed to be stillbirths from that marriage. Now you could say the royal family was in pretty bad shape at this point, but this still went on through various dynasties for another 1,300 years. Isn't it amazing that for the majority of human history, the people who were in charge, the people who called the shots, were the most genetically inferior people on the planet? I mean, the fact that we managed to get this far is pretty stunning. So hey, with all the problems we've got going on in our world today, at least we don't have that problem. All right, thanks for watching this video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, please do check out some of my other stuff if you're not already subscribed to this channel. And if you like those, maybe try subscribing because I come back with videos like this on random topics on Thursday, more science-y philosophical topics on Monday. Go check out the shirts at answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. They have a lot of fun, cool, nerdy stuff there. It helps support the channel, helps support a great designer, and it helps you uh, just be a little bit cooler. All right, thanks again for watching. Now you guys go out, have an eye-opening rest of the week. I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys. Take care.